Well, good evening, church. Here we are again, separate, uh, but still united in a, in a sense. I hope your faith in Christ is stronger this very night, this very day, than it was even before this crisis came upon us. And I have been praying for you and that this would be the case. Tonight, I want us uh, to look at a passage and I want to give you plenty of reasons for your faith in Christ to be solidified, strengthened, and firm, immovable. But to do that, I want to look uh, at a passage, at a text that shows a very dark period in Israel's history. And while that's going on, I want us to see the response from heaven. So uh, I would encourage you now, if you haven't got a Bible on your lap, please grab a Bible, uh, turn to your phone, uh, open up, and turn to Isaiah chapter 50 uh, with me. Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50 reads as following. This is what the Lord says. Where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or to which of my creditors did I sell you? Because of your sins you were sold. Because of your transgressions your mother was sent away. When I came, why was there no one? When I called, why was there no one to answer? Was my arm too short to ransom you? Do I lack the strength to rescue you? By a mere rebuke, I dry up the sea. I turn rivers into a desert. Their fish rot for lack of water and die of thirst. I clothe the sky with darkness and make sackcloth its covering. The sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears and I have not been rebellious. I have not drawn back. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore have I set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the sovereign Lord who helps me. Who is he who will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment. The moths will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word of his servant? Let him who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. But now all you who light fires and provide torches for yourselves, flaming torches, go walk in the light of your fires and of the torches you have set ablaze. This is what you shall receive from my hand. You will lie down in torment. Let's pray. Our God, what? What an awesome, what an awesome passage we have before us. There is so much here. Lord, these are your very words, the words of God. And we come as those much later down the track. But we come as those who are recipients of this word that has been handed down from generation after generation after generation. And for each generation, it has been preserved by you for us. For our children and the generations to come. May the thought of this cause us to listen attentively. God, cause us to see wondrous things in your word tonight. I pray that you would give us eyes, give us ears to hear. I pray send your word forth powerfully into our heart. And for this to happen, we are absolutely dependent upon the power of the Holy Spirit. Come now, glorify your name, exalt Christ and change us that we might be brought more into his image. Strengthen our faith through the riches of this text, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just a little bit of context to what, what happens here. You notice from the very first verse, we jump straight into something very serious here. Well, just previously in chapter 49, Israel is in distress. Israel is, is greatly troubled. She has been invaded. Babylon has surrounded her. She has been taken captive. Jerusalem now lies in rubble. And she is exiled from her land and taken away. 
A new generation in captivity of Israelites comes forth in a distant land, still captive under Babylon. Yet through this Isaiah, God uses him to make some extraordinary promises, promises of assurance and hope. Look at just a little, the whole chapter of 49 is full of it, but let me just read uh, verses 8 to 10 so you can get a glimpse of this. Verses 8 to 10. This is what the Lord says, In the time of my favor I will answer you. In the day of salvation I will help you. I will keep you and I will make you to be a covenant for the people to restore the land and to reassign its desolate inheritance. To say to the captives, come out. And to those in darkness, be free. They will feed beside the roads and find pasture on every barren hill. They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat or the sun beat upon them. He who had compassion on them will guide them and lead them beside still waters. And there are many more promises throughout the chapter that just wave after wave. But this new generation and even the old generation of Israelites, they do not believe it. They do not accept these promises. They, they, they can't get their head around it and they don't believe it to be true because look at verse 14 of that chapter. Chapter 49, verse 14. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. They, they can't see God. All they see are enemies, trouble and distress. But even though they are doubting, even though they don't believe and they won't accept these promises, God continued to make, make a flurry of glorious promises of rescue, blessings and reconciliation, restoration. Promise after promise we see in the chapter. Yet Israel disbelieves, even accuses and blames God for their situation. And so we arrive at chapter 50. Firstly, I want us to see in this chapter an ancient problem. An ancient problem. As Israel complains about their circumstances before God and, and where they are, that he has not intervened, God throws the situation back on them and the charges on them. Look at verse 1 of chapter 50. This is what the Lord says. Where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or to which of my creditors did I sell you? That's really strong languages. God challenges them to find the divorce papers that he apparently sent them away with. In that context, if a husband uh, had was displeased with his wife, if she was in the wrong, if he wanted to separate uh, from her, he would write her divorce papers. They don't believe God's promises because they are convinced that God has divorced them. He was their groom. They were his bride. They were in covenant together like a marriage. But they believe God has ended it. And God challenges them through this belief and this lack of faith and says, Go on then. Where are the divorce papers that I apparently sent you away with? Come on. And he's challenging, challenging them, saying, was I the one who brought this about? Did our falling out come from me? Did I turn from you? Come on, go. Find the papers. Where are they? I was a husband to you. He adds to this uh, address to them in the second half of that verse. Or to which of my creditors did I sell you? Again, in that context, if a father was in debt to creditors... He had the authority to sell one of his child or children into slavery in order to pay off his debts. And God is saying to them, Israel, you were an orphan and I became a father to you. I stepped in and took you in. And, and, and so what has happened? Have I now sold you to those that I'm in debt to? Have I sold you to pay off a debt to the Babylonians? The very idea of that is absolutely absurd. But God is saying, Israel, are you in this predicament because of some fault within me? Was I unfaithful to this marriage? Am I to blame in this? Well, what's the answer? He gives it at the end of verse 1. Because of your sins you were sold. Because of your transgressions, your mother was sent away. It was because of your willful rebellion against me. 
It was because of your moral perversity. It's because of your perpetual, unrelenting unfaithfulness. It's because you are not satisfied unless you commit adultery against me. See, Israel moans, God has forsaken us. And God answers back and says, you abandoned me with your every wake and breath. And God gives them what they deserve. He hands them over to the Babylonians. This is extraordinary because what did God do for them in the past? Israel had their enemies, the Egyptian, Egyptians, and God brings them out of that. And the Egyptians pursue Israel and God parts the sea and Israel goes through and God destroys the Egyptians. And he brings them safely into the land that he promised to Abraham, their promised land. But now what do we have? We see God raise up Israel's enemies to carry them out of the promised land. How can I put this simply? God detests sin. He does. It displeases him. It offends him. It dishonors him. It angers him. And there are consequences for sin. Sin destroys the fellowship that we have with God. It makes us his enemies separated from him. And you see this right back in the garden. Mankind enjoys fellowship with God. They choose to sin and they're sent away from him. Israel, God befriended them, brought them to himself. They chose sin and rebellion. God sends them away. And it is absolutely the same for every human that's born. We inherit Adam's guilt and therefore we are born separated from God. But on top of that, what mounts upon that is that we bear our own guilt of sin. And so we are separated from him. You read this over and over and over in the New Testament that we are alienated excommunicated from God we have been cast off from God this is the effect of sin and when we look at this separation it should make us want to say and make us feel poor world poor poor world yes absolutely we should feel that way but so so wicked is humanity so evil is sin this separation that mankind is experiences is exactly what they want humanity is exactly where they want to be to be divorced from God to be alienated from God to have no attachment no ties no affiliation to be perfect acquaintances with God no union they say when you're looking to buy a house and live somewhere new, it all comes down to one thing. Location, location, location. Well, humanity has hit the jackpot. Separation from God. That's what they want. That's where they want to be. Now, you may say, Nathan, you're, you're, you, you, you go too far here. Or you're exaggerating the situation. Have you never read Psalm 2? What does it say? Why do the nations rage? Why do they plot a vain thing together? The kings and the rulers and the nations of the earth gather together and conspire against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break off his bonds. Let us cast off his chains that we might be rid of him. This is what mankind wants, the world wants. This is what the non-Christian wants. If you're listening and you do not obey and follow Christ, if you do not belong to him, this is your heart. Some of you, is it not true? Do you not say in your heart when confronted with God, don't tell me that lust is wrong. Don't tell me that I cannot covet the things and the materialistic things of this world. Don't tell me I cannot serve God and money. Don't tell me that I need to dedicate my entire Sundays to him. Don't give me that. Don't tell me he's in charge of me. Don't tell, don't tell me that he is Lord over my life. In a word, don't tell me that my sin is sinful. 
What is all of it? I hate His commands. I hate His authority over my life. Man screams out when confronted with God. Oh, that I would be fully and thoroughly divorced from God. I do not want Him. Christian parents, do not be ignorant of the hearts of your children, of the hearts of your teenagers. Do not be deceived by the Sunday school answers that they give you. They may not be who they claim to be. What happens so much of the time? They come here and they answer all the questions and they sit with you in church. But what happens in so many cases when they hit the age of 18 or when they go off to uni, they leave. Why? Finally, they're away from your authority. Finally, they get what they want. Separation from God and they depart from Him. This is what mankind wants. How God has exposed Israel in these words. But he's not done yet. Verse 2. He furthers his interrogation. Look, when I came, why was there no one? When I called, why was there no one to answer? He charges them with rejection. Now, our sin is great because we have chosen to be far from God. We've chosen defiance, but our sin is extraordinarily great because we sin against a merciful God. Do you notice? God comes to the rescue. God comes to show pity. God comes to show mercy. He does not come to crush them. He does not come to give them justice. He does not come and open the gates of hell to sweep them all in for their rebellion. No, no, no. What does he come To do for those who've sinned and rebel against him who want nothing to do with him. What does he do? It says in this passage, the Lord speaks, I came to you. I called to you. He is the God who seeks out sinners. People will not come to him and he goes out to them. This is what we read over and over in the Old Testament and never ceases to amaze me. A wicked people, God sends to them prophet after prophet after prophet. They get angel visitations. They get those who teach and remind them of the covenant that God has made with them. The scriptures. This is the rescuing, protecting, redeeming God, the merciful God. In Isaiah, he's compared to an eagle who comes with healing in his wings. The reality is, the reality is he should come to bring recompense. He should rid evil. He should cleanse the earth. He should remove those who continue to defile it. But he doesn't. He comes to call those who don't love him. To call them back to himself, back into reconciliation and peace with him. And this generous God who comes and calls to them, who comes to approach them, to bring them back. How do the people respond to such a gracious and loving God? How does Israel respond? God says, when I came, why was there no one? When I called out, why was there no one to answer? What's he saying? I turned up and you didn't. No one. I call and call and you do not answer. I reach out, I reach out and you continue to mute me. You will have nothing of me. You disregard everything that I offer you. When I came, I should have found a multitude who were broken, sorry, repentant, laid prostrate before me. But what did I find? No one. None. He offers grace and mercy and forgiveness and they throw it in his face. Throw it back at him. This is humanity's great sin. God calls and we block our ears. God comes to us and we avoid him like a plague, like a sickness. You see it, don't you? I cannot tell you how many times I've experienced it when talking to people, when talking to family. 
Everything is wonderful until you bring up God and you bring up eternity. And what happens? What's the response? I don't want to talk about God. I don't want to talk about these things. Don't bring up this conversation. They don't want to be anywhere near him. And I, I want to ask you, is that you? Whether you call yourself a Christian or not, are you living in disobedience, in rebellion to him? Maybe you are backsliding. Maybe you're turning away, away in coldness towards him. And he says, in, under, in undeserving grace, I've come to you. I'm calling. I'm calling out. Come on, no more of this. Turn from your sin. Come to me and I will pardon freely. Come and believe in me. But here in the text, God reinforces that the, that, that the fault is not on his part. Not as it, It's not that he is unable. Look at verses, the end of verse 2 to 3. Was my arm too short to, rest, to ransom you? Do I lack the strength to rescue you? By a mere rebuke I dry up the sea. I turn rivers into a desert. The fish rot for a lack of water and die of thirst. I clothe the sky with darkness and make sackcloth its covering. Do I lack the power? Is this happening because I can't bring you back? Have you forgotten so quickly what I've done for you in the past? Look what he says. Do I lack the strength to rescue you? Didn't I not deliver you from the superpower of the world, Egypt? Can I not do the same against the Babylonians? I dry up the seas, he says in this verse. Isn't that what he did to the Red Sea? Israel walked through, walked through the middle of it on dry ground. He says, I make the fish to rot and, and die from a lack of water. Is that not what he did when he turned the Nile into blood? And he says, I clothe the sky with darkness. Do I lack the power? Have you forgotten what I did to the Egyptians? I turned the sun off for three days towards the Egyptians while you had light. Do I lack the power? What's his point? Are you in this predicament because of me? No, this distress is because of you. And I, on top of that, was merciful and you rejected me. Yet in all of this, God holds out these promises of deliverance. God is, is saying, despite all your sins, I can reverse this. I am powerful enough. I am gracious enough. I can fix this. Now let me, let me appeal to you, Christian. You who are caught up in an addiction. You who are entangled in sin. You who seem to have no power against sin that takes a hold of you. You who continue to fall, continue to fall into luke, lukewarmness. God says to you, is my arm too short? Do I lack the power to rescue you? Do I lack the power to bring victory in your life over this? I'm sustaining this universe galaxy by galaxy. Do I not have the power? I change the seasons. I change the tide. Can I not change you? Can I not do this? Well, God has promised to Israel who are in distress the seemingly impossible. He promises full reconciliation, full restoration, deliverance, abundant peace, a restored covenant, fellowship with him again. How can this happen? How is this possible when humanity has this ongoing disease, this bent on sin, this enslavement to sin? God could give a million promises, wonderful as they may be. How can man change from resorting to their ways? Well, there's a pause from God. And in our chapter, a new figure is brought onto the, onto the scene. There is a third party that arrives. And God's response is so incredible, it would have made absolutely no sense to the hearers of this prophecy. I want you to see, secondly, here tonight in this passage, heaven's, heaven's antidote. Heaven's antidote. Now, in, this, in, this, in, in Isaiah, just a heads up, there are four sections within Isaiah, and they are called the servant songs. The servant songs. And these servant songs refer to this mysterious figure who seems to represent Israel. 
In chapter 50, we have here the second of these four servant songs. The one that you're probably most familiar with is found in Isaiah 53, that incredible passage. But each of these servant songs prophesy and give insight into one who will redeem Israel, who will do a wonderful work, who will bring about a new world, who will bring this peace and salvation. The servant of Yahweh, the servant of the Lord is of Israel, but he's nothing like them. Well, in this chapter here, we see five glimpses into, into this servant that appears. Five glimpses into God's servant. The first one I want you to see is that he was first a disciple before he was a discipler. The first thing we see is he was first a disciple before he was a discipler. Look at verses 4 to 5a. The sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning. He wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears. We see here that this servant, he's been given an instructed tongue to know the words to sustain the weary. Who in this world is not weary? What is it? Some are weary of work. Some are weary of old age. Some are weary of bodily ailments. Some are weary of relationships and people. Some are simply weary of sin and its consequences. And yet here is a servant, it says, that he has been granted this ability to give words that sustain the weary. How can he bring such relief to universal grief? How can he do that? Well, it says he has been given by the Lord, from the Lord, an instructed tongue. Now, that word there is so important. Literally, the Hebrew word there means he has been given a discipled tongue, a learned, trained tongue from the sovereign Lord. And this is so interesting. This figure, he was discipled by God before he gathered unto himself disciples. He was taught of God so that he could teach others. He was continually hearing the word of the Lord. This servant is the perfect fulfillment of Psalm 1. That blessed man whose delight is in the law of the Lord and in it he meditates day and night. He is able with a word to sustain the weary. So when this servant finally comes, he emerges amidst the crowds and he is able to say, come to me, all you who are weary, and I'll give you rest. He's able to do that. And look how he receives this discipled tongue, how he receives these words to pass on to the weary. Look at verse 4. He, the end of verse 4. He wakens me morning by morning and wakens my ear to listen to him. Isn't this exactly what we see in Jesus' life? In the early hours of the morning when everyone's asleep, Jesus rises to pray. The disciples set out in a boat across the waters. Jesus retreats to the mountain to pray. He's busy and busy with the full days of ministry, but you see him continually retreating in prayer. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the disciples are asleep and he's on the ground in fervent prayer. He was always in communion with God. He always sat at his father's feet. God sought after him and he sought after God. Now contrast him with Israel. Remember what we read. God called out to them. And there was no answer. God sought after them and Israel was nowhere to be seen. Now contrast that with this servant. It says God calls out to him morning by morning and he answers and responds every single time. We marvel when we read the account of the little boy Samuel. The Lord speaks to him and calls out to him in the middle of the night. And that boy responds... Here I am. I'm listening. Speak. Well, well, God, he calls out to this servant and he says, my son, my son, 
come to me. And Jesus responds, my father, my father, I come every single time. Every single morning, morning by morning, he was the greatest disciple unto God that ever lived. And therefore, he is able to gather unto himself a multitude of disciples. Christian, how unlike Jesus are we? How much are you like me? How much are you like me? God How often does the Lord call out to us late at night, in the middle of the night, in the early hours of the morning, in the free moments we have, come out, come out, come to me, my child, come to me, come away with me, come listen to my word, hear me speak, come, come and pray, come and speak to me, come and wait upon me. And we silence him, we drown him out with other things, not now. Not today. An unbeliever. Let me address you. How often has the Lord called out to you from this pulpit? How long has he reached out his hands to you? How long has he spoken and called you by name? And yet each time you hear and listen. And you put him to the side as if he's speaking to everyone else but you. How often... When he called Israel, called out to them, there was not one who answered. But when he called out to his servant, the servant answered every single time. So we see that as the first thing, glimpse we get into this servant. The second glimpse Isaiah gives us into this servant who will come. The second thing is he has opened ears and is obedient to the command of God. He has opened ears and is obedient to the command of God. Look at verse 5. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears and I have not been rebellious. I have not drawn back. Do you see the emphasis of Isaiah here? He's opened my ears, the servant says. I have listening ears, ears that can hear. Why Why is this emphasis made about the listening and the ears? Because this was Israel's problem. Deafness towards God, not listening. God says, I call and you do not listen. You do not hear. Israel's problem is humanity's problem. God speaks and man refuses to listen. God teaches and man cannot understand. God gives commands and man hates them and suppresses them. Contrast that with the servant. It says he has opened ears. He has listening ears. He has awakened ears. Oh, this is our greatest need. This is the greatest need of this world. Oh, yes, at this time in history, our livelihood is in jeopardy. Our health is vulnerable. The economy is in a dangerous situation. And yet our greatest need, the overarching need is open ears. Open ears. Jesus, when he preached, he would conclude, he who has ears, let him hear. Now, there was no, no better preacher than Jesus, no one who spoke better than him. And yet Jesus says to the Jews in John chapter 8, verse 43, he says to them, why do you not understand what I say? Because you are unable to hear what I say. This is the universal disease. You want to talk about pandemic? Here is a disease that has touched every single person. Isolated and not. All are affected by this disease. Deafened ears unto God. Look what he's opened. This this servant. Look at what his opened ears leads to. Verse 5. The end of verse 5. I have not been rebellious. I have not drawn back. Do you not see the great chasm here? God opens by saying, I sent you away because of your sins, because of your transgressions. You were rebellious. You turned your back upon me. And now this servant speaks up and says, but I, Lord, I have not been rebellious to you and I have not turned back to you. Jesus is nothing like us. He is sinless. He is faithful. He is obedient. We've seen these Two glimpses, two glimpses into this servant of the Lord. But when you look at these two 
so far, these two, they don't help us one bit. They are of no help to us. God called Jesus. He listened. He responded. We didn't. God gave instructions to Jesus. Jesus understood. He obeyed. We didn't. That does not help us. Rather than help us, it's not good news. It's only bad news. Because his perfections only serve to highlight how great and, and, and enormous are our shortcomings. They only highlight our fallenness. It only makes our sins stand out the more. So it's of no help to us. But the next glimpse that Isaiah gives us into the servant of the Lord, this brings the cure to humanity's curse. The third glimpse he gives us is that this servant, his obedience goes all the way to sacrifice. He's obedient unto sacrifice. This third one, look at verse 6 with me. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Look at what the servant of the Lord will receive. And when you look at that treatment, the pulling of the beard, the, 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 the flogging upon his back, the mocking, the spitting, the shame, the humiliation. What sense does this make in light of what we read in this whole chapter and in chapter 49? What sense does it make? Israel rebels against God. They sin. They offend God. They break all of his laws. They are the picture of an adulteress. And yet, what's God's response? I am going to lavish upon you promises of rescue, blessing and peace and restoration. And then we come here to this servant who never, ever, ever sins against the Lord. He obeys all of his commands. He is blameless, devoted to God. And what has he allocated this? What do you see from this? What happens to him? God sends him into the lion's den. God causes his servant to be bitten by the snake upon his heel. God is causing the Red Sea to close upon his servant. Abraham's knife is put away and Isaac is able to get off the altar because the servant becomes the ram caught in the bushes. God makes this servant stand upon Jonah's boat and he casts the servant into a more raging sea. He is thrown, bound into the fiery furnace. And God is preparing this one to be the lamb upon the altar of God. This is what is allocated to this servant. The one who had just said, O Lord, my father, I have given my life in devotion to you. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned back. And all of this happens to him. You see, when you look at what's happening... You keep the Old Testament in mind and you understand exactly what's happening, don't you? In the Old Testament, sacrifices for the people's sin needed to be special sacrifices. They need to be unblemished animals. And here, one comes, a man arrives on the scene, the only human to be special and blameless, unblemished. And he becomes the only fit one. To be laid upon the sacrificial altar of God. Not the blood of animals. But the blood of the servant of the Lord. How could Israel's sin be pardoned in the past? How was God able to bless and show favour and befriend this rebellious sinful people? By bloodshed. By a sacrifice. And now, these for these exiles... These cast off Israel, these alienated Jews, how could they be restored? How could they be recipients of all of these blessings? Through the precious blood of the servant of the Lord. You see, this is good news. If it was just his obedience that this servant was completely obedient and and always obeyed God's commands... That would only further condemn us and accentuate our sin if he did not die in our place. 
But now this is good news. The gospel, it actually means good news. And what's happening here is good news. We did not deserve this. Do you notice what it says in verse 6? The very first words. I offered. The servant says, I offered my back. I offered my face. I offered myself to be humiliated and suffer. What's he saying? The servant's saying to all of us, you weren't worthy. But because my father loves you and because I do too, I will give myself. I offer myself for you. That's what he's saying. And so this is, this is an incredible, incredible thing that's happening here. Do you remember in verses 2 to 3, God's saying, Am I not powerful to rescue you? Am I not strong enough to deliver you from this? Do I lack the power? O oh, Israel, I dried up the seas. I turn the sky into darkness. I clothe it. I turn off the lights in this universe. Am I not powerful? And yet... To rescue not just Israel, but this entire world. How was the power and the strength of the Lord revealed? The power of God is revealed in the form of a servant. God taking the form of a servant, suffering in the place of his ungrateful creatures. Behold the power of God. Have you, have you believed in him? Have you received him? Have you accepted this? This rescue, the power of God revealed. Isaiah's prophecy, there's, there's more he wants to show us. There's more glimpses. He's saying there's more, there's more, there's more I want to show you. There's more I want to show you. Let me show you the fourth glimpse he gives us into the servant of the Lord. The fourth thing we see is that he alone displays perfect faith. He alone displays perfect faith. Look at verse 7. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint and I know I will not be put to shame. I have set my face like flint, the servant of the Lord says. Where is he setting his face? Well, read the New Testament and it says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He's staring at Calvary. Nothing will stop him from going to that hill with our sin upon his shoulders. And as he endures the suffering of the cross and the punishment of God for sin, if you listen very carefully to him on the cross, you will hear him singing silently. Even so, it is well, it is well with my soul, O Lord. What causes him to endure this dreadful, this dreadful cross, this dreadful suffering? It's amazing. His faith. In God. Verse 7. The sovereign Lord helps me. I know I will not be put to shame. The sermon saying. I know when I die. He will not leave me in the tomb to rot. He who promised is true. I believe in him. My faith is in him. It's so, this is so important. Jesus endures the wrath of man. He endures the wrath of God. And he does it not by relying upon himself or his own power. But he does it by relying and trusting in God. Think about this. He is the son of God. Equal in power with the father. Equal in glory with the father. Yet what he was to accomplish was done through faith in God. And he did this because he was to accomplish what we failed in. Israel didn't maintain faith in God. He does. We trust in ourselves. We live as though we are our own saviors. And one comes whose faith is perfect in God till the very end. He demonstrates pure, unflinching confidence in God. And so where we fell... A substitute triumphed by perfect faith in God. What faith he has. So he resolves, I have set my face like flint for the cross. I will pay your debt, O sinner. I will. And so 
I ask you, you who are you who are in sin, you who don't belong to him, have you come to love him today? Have you come to love him? And you who are a Christian, have you now through this, has your heart been overwhelmed by your first love all over again? Is it a new honeymoon experience for you all over again? But there's one more thing that Isaiah wants to show us. One more privileged glimpse into the servant of the Lord. He wants, us to, he wants to show us lastly the vindication he receives from God. The vindication. Look at verses 8 to 9. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the sovereign Lord who helps me. Who is he who will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment. The moss will eat them up. The servant of the Lord finds himself encircled by his animals, by his enemies, like animals they are. He's encircled and they seek to discredit him. They seek to smear his righteousness. They seek to defame his name. And yet he challenges them to their faith. He says, who can bring a charge against me? Which of you can condemn me? Who? Oh, this is a wonderful thing. Again, when he says, who of you can lay charges against me? Whom shall find me guilty? Look at the contrast. Page after page of the scriptures, we see God laying charge after charge against Israel. Oh, you who I made you my bride, you are adulterers now. Oh, you who disobey the, disobey the commands that I give to you. You who bribe judges, who abuse the poor, who are unjust. And who love every kind of evil. You who are to be a light to the nations. You've only increased the darkness in this world. He's saying charge after charge. Your guilt abounds in a court of law. As the charges are rolled out. It would only be pronounced guilty, 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 guilty. And then one comes forth in this perverse world. So pure and so faithful. He can come up and say who can lay a charge against me. Who are you? Bring me to court and which court would find me guilty? Not one of you. Where are my accusers? Where are they? There's none like him. There's none like him. Here is the difference with Christianity. God lays charges against every single human being. Everyone is guilty except one. There is one who is innocent and he stands alone. He's glorious. That's why it's absolute foolishness for preachers to tell people to this glorious one to say, oh, accept him into your heart. No, no, you do not ask him to come into your heart. You come and you bow before him. You come repentant and you fall on your knees and you plead for mercy and you take him as the son of God, your savior. That's what happens. He's incredible. He's amazing. And God vindicates him. The servant says, he who vindicates me is near. How does God vindicate him? Through power on the third day. While the, while the servant is dead. On the third day, God raises him from the dead. God vindicates the servant of the Lord. Every human has gone to the grave. But this one is vindicated and I think it's amazing. This is so extraordinary, these words. When the servant says, who can lay a charge against me? Or he's sinless. So he can say that. But where have you heard those words in the New Testament? We hear Paul say them in Romans chapter 8. But he's not quoting Jesus. Paul goes on to say, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. He's chosen us, predestined us. He'll bring us unto glory. And then he takes these words of the servant and he applies them to us and he says, who can bring a charge against us? This is, this is amazing. Jesus says, who can charge me with guilt? And now because his death is on our part, because he's made us clean, because we are set free from the condemnation of sin, Paul writes and he says, now you are able to say, who can bring a charge against me? Clean, clean, clean and guiltless. So let me close. And I say to you, exiled sinners, disobedient, defiant to your maker. Have your sins been dealt with? 
after living a life of being your own saviour, have you now come? Have you approached the servant of the Lord who is revealed in these pages and have you come to believe in him? He is the only option that you have. There is none other. He reaches out and he calls to you. He reaches out and he calls to you. He who has ears to hear, let him hear the God who calls. Let me pray. Father, these words in this passage are glorious. They're amazing. And we thank you that you've preserved them for us. I pray for those who belong to you, that their confidence and their hope and their trust may only be further solidified in Christ. May they be immovable and may they rejoice at the thought of being able to say to every accuser, who dares lay a charge against me? I pray for those who have spent their lives rejecting Christ, that they would come and embrace the servant of the Lord by faith and that they would have their sins pardoned and experience eternal life. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You would notice that I purposefully left out verses 10 and 11. Well, Lord willing, I want to come back to them next week. I, there is too much in them, and I believe they deserve their own sermon. So until then, read them, read those verses, pray about them, meditate about them, and come prepared again to hear from the Lord, Lord willing. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.